So next up is uh, Barbara Swenson. So Barbara is a naturopathic doctor and a registered dietitian. She holds master's degrees in nutrition, holistic nutrition, and natural health. Barbara has spent 28 years of experience in nutrition medicine, geriatric, HIV, and 15 years in oncology. She currently works with organ transplant at the University Transplant Center, which is a collaboration of UT Health and University Hospitals. So she's going to talk to us about nutrition and how to use that to maximize your health. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? You could probably hear me if I didn't have a mic. Well, thank you for having me today. I don't know if Dot De La Rosa is here. Um, she had lung transplant at our facility and is now an a, amazing volunteer. So I'm here because of her invitation and her presenting me to the committee. So I'm just delighted to be here. My mother uh, had lung cancer and had a lobectomy and survived lung cancer. So I was on oxygen many years. So I have my teeth sort of cut in pulmonary. So I am just going to talk pretty naturally. I used to be in the food service business and worked my way up to chef. And my last name is Swanson. And I, I worked in the, the bar industry a long time and the food industry a long time, so I get it. I'm not, you know, I have a lot of degrees, but it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's reality about how hard it is to change our behaviors. I get that. Um, naturopathic doctor means that I now work in the world of functional medicine, which I love because it really helps people to understand the root causes of what's keeping us from becoming the people that we want to be. So basically, in the, in the transplant setting, we look at what, what type of nutrition, where are we going to go, but it's based upon what type of lung disease you have, if, if, you know, if you're going to move forward into transplant, and where's your health? BMI is such a scary word for people. It just means body mass index, and it just means how uh, your height and weight are, you know, are they within a range that's acceptable? And it's not because we hate people. It's because if you have a lot of, a lot of abdominal mass, it increases uh, your risk of getting a successful procedure. So it's all about just helping you to get where you want to go. So when I look at somebody, I want them, like Carol was saying, through the rehab arm, is to keep your muscles. Another thing that people, I've been doing this in transplant for five years. I started in January uh, five years ago, that um, you act, actually can influence your uh, carbon dioxide production or, re or reduction. So if your lung's job is to trade oxygen for carbon dioxide, most people don't realize that what you eat influences carbon dioxide production. So that's pretty exciting. And again, I help people to lose weight slowly, um, help them to regain muscle. Rehab is the, the element to do that, but we also have to make sure you're eating enough protein. And again, if you're moving forward to transplant, looking toward exceptional wound healing after transplant. So this is, on the left, is what a, a normal muscle looks like. An atrophied muscle, atrophy means it's just shrinking. You've heard this expression, if you don't use it, you lose it. So again, I'm gonna keep drawing Carol, and I appreciate her talking about the nutrition arm, because they're just hand in glove. They're just essential to you being successful, either while you're waiting to get a transplant or you're years away from that, just feeling better today, just having an amazing quality of life. And on the right side, that's what happens. So you can look the same on the outside and your pants still feel the same, but if your muscle's shrinking on the inside, you're gonna feel tired, you're really gonna be fatigued. Muscle is the factory that produces the energy. So all the food that we eat goes into that muscle cell in this little factory called the mitochondria, and it goes spits out carbon dioxide, water, and energy. So when people are fatigued, we go, what are you eating and how much muscle do you have? How can we get your muscle back? So that's an integral part of the nutrition arm. This is just a busy slide, and it's all to say, a sarcopenia is that thing I just showed you where the muscle starts to shrink. It statistically makes a difference in how fast you heal. If you get any type of procedure, it's, it's tightly linked to that. So the, 
and this slide is just a study that shows that in the, in the green part you'll see overall survival in people that had transplants was, lo uh, was longer in people that had more muscle mass than people that had less muscle mass. And there's a whole bunch of statistics behind that, but I don't want to bore you. We, at Transplant, we have this great device called the in-body. Has anybody ever been exposed to the in-body device at all? Anybody? One, two? It's amazing. This, this is me uh, in high school. So <laughs> I thought, this, this is what I really look like. So you basically stand on this thing that looks like a scale. You wear as light clothing as possible. Do it first thing in the morning before you've had anything to eat or any water. We have one of these at university. We got a grant. And you, you hold these calipers, and your arm is are, you know, aside from your body, and you just stand on it, and it measures everything. So this is, an, this is Jane Doe, but it tells you how much, again, you, you enter your height and your weight and your age, that's all, and you just stand there for 60 seconds, and it sends an imperceptible electrical current through your body, and it tells you how much water you have, how much muscle you have, and how much fat you have. So this has been valuable in helping people move forward into transplant because sometimes you can look like your BMI body mass index is over 30, but you might have more muscle than fat, and that will be the de determinant in you moving forward into getting a transplant. So this is just kind of a sheet, what it looks like. And on this, um, if you go, I do it for my patients that want to. Not Once a month is too often, maybe once every two months. But what you want to see is, you see how the weight's coming down? SMM is skeletal muscle mass. The trouble is, you lose weight too fast, your, your muscle mass is going to go down, but the percent body fat's going down. People get very excited to lose the weight because they want the transplant, but they're like not doing it right, not doing rehab, not eating well, and they're losing weight from the muscles and making themselves sarcopenic. We don't want to go there. We want to keep as much muscle as possible by moving and eating well. So let's talk about how to eat. This is amazing. I have like three masters and a doctor. It was in the food service business forever. And it's like, oh my gosh, it comes down to like four things. It's amazing. It's like, I want my, I want my money back. But <laughs> nobody would have believed me if I didn't have all these pieces of paper. So you basically want to eat four things every time you eat. This is ridiculously simple, but more often than not, people, when I tell them how, what this looks like, they just sigh and moan. So on, now you can get this off of myplate.gov. That's where this came from, the United States Department of Agriculture. You may have remembered the food pyramid and all those crazy things, which was crazy. I owe probably 5,000 people a serious apology for teaching the food pyramid because it's lame. But basically, protein, this is your protein group and this is your dairy group, they're the same. Somebody, probably the dairy council, paid a lot of money to have that blue circle on this plate. You don't have to add dairy. And some people, dairy causes mucus and makes it harder for them. So like, don't worry about it. Eat four things. So you want to eat protein, a grain, whole grain, a fruit, and a vegetable. That's all you want to do. Does anybody see sugar on this plate? <laughs> right? Guess what we all want to eat when we're bummed out and I can't breathe and I'm depressed? I want to eat sugar. This is my platform to tell you, stop it. Because sugar is, I tell everybody, it's just a pile of chemicals. It's not about shame. It's not about guilt. It's not about, oh, shoulda, coulda, woulda. God, I don't believe in that. It's what is this pile of chemicals on this plate doing or not doing for the health, the BMI, or what is breathing better? Sugar is glucose, which is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. That's all it is, right? Pile of chemicals. Protein is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. It's got some nitrogen in it. So it's just a pile of chemicals. Sugar has um, a property that when it gets inside your mouth, your brain goes, yes! That's called dopamine. It's like heroin and marijuana and opioids do that, boop, that pop. Can we do it some more? But what else is happening besides the emotional thing in the brain is that sugar is going into your liver and it's causing a flamethrower to turn on. Sugar feeds inflammation. So as a naturopathic doctor, 
no matter what people are coming to me to talk about, I'm like, we, we're trying to put the fires out in the body. Because fires cause cell damage, and cell damage is what is, you know, IPF or ILD. They're inflammatory processes, and, you know, things are going south. We don't want to feed that process. So I've got this reality of this addiction going, gimme, 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 gimme. But at the same time, my body's going, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. So my happy task with my lung patients is to, you know, we, we visit a lot. I call them on the phone. They come in. I talk to them a lot on the phone. A lot of people are coming from out of town. It's to help them slowly get off of the sugar addiction. Not because they're bad or dumb or stupid, but because sugar is very addicting, and it's feeding the fires of inflammation. So remember what I said about everything we eat produces carbon dioxide, energy, and water right? It's, everything we eat produces those three things. So we have fats, carbohydrates, and protein. Sugar produces more carbon dioxide than any other, I'm not even going to call it a food, I'm going to call it a food-like product. It produces more carbon dioxide per gram than any other food source. If I can't breathe that well, I don't want to be making carbon dioxide, right? I don't want to be producing that thing that's making my life more difficult. So another thing that sugar does, it goes through a pathway that turns a switch on to, to store fat. So if i got to get my BMI down and I can't breathe that well, the first thing, if you can let go of sugar, it takes three weeks and you're done. You're done. If you just say, I'm done, I'm not doing it. Pastries, Cokes, all of that. I hate to do this because I'm always the one before lunch or after the snacks. And I'm like wearing dark glasses and a blonde wig. Wait, this is real. No, it's not. <laughs> um, but it's, it's not about judging anything at all. We're done with judging. We're about being wise and being observing. Is this what I want to do right now? I do have treats every now and then, but as I'm just getting older. I'm like, I'm tired of this weight struggle. Stopped eating sugar, lost four pounds the first week, and I just, it's just cool. Your body just knows what to do. So it's all about looking at food in a different way. It's a pile of chemicals. What is it doing? Do I want this to happen? Not should. I never do should. I don't even tell people anymore what I do for a living because they just start judging me <laughs> instead of me judging them. Who knew? So glad. Should have been a nurse. Anyway, four things looks like this. It's just four things. It's no big deal. It's real food, not processed food. Processed means I have to open a cellophane something to get to it. Or it's coming through a drive through right? Something chemicals, food-like product things. Got things in it I can't pronounce. Again, all of those chemicals, again, are are feeding inflammation in the body. We're trying to bring inflammation down. I call it, you know, it's like medicine. It's food medicine. So here's your real potatoes, and there's some, unfortunately, in the picture has uh, white bread, but whole grains as much as possible. W-H-O-L-E, not H-O-L-E, like donut hole. <laughs> real whole. Brown rice, you know, things like that. Um, there's your protein, and there is your vegetable. No big deal. It's just food. It's just four things. A lot of times people will eat only, like, they, their first meal will be maybe some, this is classic, Fruit Loops, Frosted Flakes, and milk. And then they, um, what, what else do they have? Maybe a bagel. So it's just all this white flour and sugar, and then they wonder why they want to take a nap in 30 minutes. They blame the lung disease that I want to take a nap. It's like, no, the sugar's causing you to have jacked up blood sugar. You're exhausted. Your insulin's shoving all that sugar in a fat cell. And I'm like, let's just go to bed and start over in another hour. And that's not, that's not what I call quality of life, personally. It's, it's up to you. Um, again, it's just different, different varieties, but it's basically four things. Just, the milk, if you want, you don't have to have the milk. Cereal is the whole grain. Milk is the protein. Strawberries or blueberries on your cereal, and you're good to go. Not everybody throws um, vegetables on their cereal. But on the, on the weekends, if you want to, like, have some eggs and put a lot of tomatoes and mushrooms and onions in those eggs and have a whole wheat or a whole grain tortilla of some sort, whole wheat toast. It's just food, but it's food that I'm thinking about, that I'm intentional about, and that I'm being on purpose about. Weight loss 
is a pleasant secondary effect of eating well. Most of the people that I work with are mainly overweight because they're eating sugar and white flour because they're bummed out, they're depressed, and that is a natural go-to for someone that's depressed or sad. But just we just start with one thing. Where can we start with one thing and we move forward? Unfortunately, after transplant, a lot of my patients regain the lost weight, and that just breaks my heart, but it's the sugar, it's a sugar thing. It's very addicting in the brain, and you know, we, baby steps, we just do baby steps. So protein can be anything from an animal. So we eat cows, cows make milk, milk turns into cheese, yogurt, cottage cheese. We eat chickens, chickens make eggs. We eat pigs, pigs don't make anything except lovely bacon, um, lamb, veal, things like that, fish, etc. So those are animal proteins. You can also have protein from non-animal sources. So pinto beans, black beans, hummus, is made up of a garbanzo bean and a sesame seed. So sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, sesame seeds, soy products, soy burgers, soy milk, things like that. So those are non-animal proteins. So I have a lot of veg vegetarian clients. So if, if you have a chalupa, which has a corn tortilla, some smashed pinto beans, and lots of lettuce and tomato on there, rock and roll, you've got four things in one chalupa. So it's not really... Uh, difficult to do. It does take some uh, being intentional about it. And I take people wherever they are and go, it's not where I want you to go, it's where do you want to go? I'm not your mom, I'm not the cattle prod, you know, I'm, I'm not the boss of you, you're the, you're the boss of you. I just want to be your coach and your cheer, cheerleader and help you to get where you want to go. I have a lot of science to back out, to back what I'm saying, but people, you know, some people are interested in the science and some people are just like, just help me to get where I need to go. And that's my happy task is to do that. Oh, yes, nuts and peanut butter. Those are other sources. Cashew butter. Those are, those are whole wheat bread, peanut butter, some, some fruit, and you're good to go. It doesn't have to be complicated. It can be portable. I don't have to be Emerald Lagasse or Rachel Ray. I don't have to have stainless steel, everything in a kitchen well-equipped. I can live, do this on a budget. I lived for three years as a single parent on $5,000 a year. And there's no challenge you can give me that I can't help you figure that out, because we can. It's not expensive. Uh, organic is ideal, and that's becoming even more affordable. So I'm really happy about that. Whole grains, again, W-H-O-L-E, means they have all three parts. It has the bran, the, the starchy part, and it has the germ. So think of a hard-boiled egg that you zoom across the middle. So the, the bran is the shell, the starch is the white stuff, and the germ is the yolk. So whole grains have all three parts. So what that looks like in the marketplace is you want to look for that word 100% whole. If it says made with whole grains, that's a way to get you to go, oh, there's that word whole, Barbara said. But if it says made with, that means it has a sprinkling of it in there so they can market it, but it's not 100% whole. That's brown rice. Wild rice isn't really rice. It's kind of a grassy seed, but it's awesome. Um, there's some products, again, and I, I don't know everything on the market. Um, quinoa is a fat. It's kind of a seed and a grain together. Very easy to cook. It's like rice, two parts water, one part grain, and boom, you've got quinoa in 15 minutes. So these are just decent things out there. I'm not a real big fan of instant things, except for this guy, Minute, or another brand, I forget the name of it, it has an instant brown rice, so it's sort of pre-boiled. You just boil the water, thank you for nodding, and you just put it in the water, boom, put the lid on, walk away. You don't have to watch it or anything. So it just rehydrates, but it's actually a decent product. It just has a little bit less fiber than if you boiled the brown rice for 45 minutes. But there's a plethora of whole grain products now on the shelf. So uh, enjoy. Some people don't like the taste of whole grain pasta at first. So I tell them, start, use half and half. So let's say you're making spaghetti, start your water boiling, put the whole wheat pasta in, wait a minute and a half, and then throw your white pasta in, and they'll cook at the same time. And you just sneak it in with your family. My kids ate soy for years before they even figured it out. Neener, neener. Told you I was broke, so we did good. I snuck snowy beans into everything. Ha, ha, ha. 
Fruit. Fruit is fruit. We all know what fruit is. Juice is not fruit. It's made from fruit, but it's a glass of sugar. What does sugar do? Makes more carbon dioxide, which makes it harder for me to breathe, and it feeds fires. So sugar makes me fat, and it makes it hard for me to breathe. Anybody want those things on purpose? It doesn't mean we can't have treats. It's being wise. I'm gonna, I keep circling back to sugar because I just am on a vendetta. Um, a serving of fruit is just about as big as a tennis ball, like that size of plum. It's no big deal. You don't have to get anal about fruit. I get this question all the time. You told me that sugar is bad for me. I never use that word, but it, I say whatever. It, it, this is simple to me. Did God make it or did a human make it? It's like that simple. God made fruit. He's, he made carrots. He's not in heaven going, ho, 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 made you look. I'm going to kill you with this carrot. It's like so illogical. I got a lot of science to back that up. But a fruit isn't going to raise your blood glucose if you have it, what? Imbalance. Look what's across from, oh, it's not there. I won't do that. But on the plate thing, have fruit with some protein, like some cheese, cottage cheese, apple and peanut butter, something like that. Just have a little piece of protein in there to sub but it won't raise your blood sugar anyway because fruit doesn't do that. It's like your tongue, your mouth, your brain, your digestive tract all know that fruit's supposed to be there because we're designed to eat it. So it doesn't raise your blood glucose, even for diabetics. It's mind-boggling. Apples have an amazing compound in them called pectin, and pectin's like a sponge, and it goes, boop, it turns into gel. So when you eat the apple, it's just nice and slow how it goes into your bloodstream. Plus, you're eating the peel, hopefully. Hopefully organic. This is another free one. Go to ewg.org, environmentalworkinggroup.org, ewg, thank you. And it will tell you, it has the clean 15 and the dirty dozen. The dirty dozen are fruits and vegetables that you probably should buy organic because they're very, very highly sprayed. The clean 15 are fruits and vegetables that are probably okay to eat. It's typically the ones with thicker skins like bananas and cantaloupes and things like that. You just wash them really well, but it, it, that, kind of, that uh, list varies, so just check it out. It's free. It's a really great website. Again, just eat food, real food. And what did Michael Pollan say? Eat real food, plants, and not too much of it. It's pretty simple. I like that. Oops, wrong one. Again, these are serving size. I don't, do they have a copy of the slides? I don't know. This just gives you an idea of what serving sizes are. I like to be able to use my hand. We're not all walking around with cups and measures in the restaurants. Vegetables, yay, I love veggies. They're awesome. Look at the color, right? Oh, back to juice. Um, I put veggie juice on there because veggie juice is different than uh, fruit juice. Fruit juice is the same as soda. It's, it's, I'll, I'll spend five minutes telling people that and they go, so can I make homemade juice? <laughs> okay. Um, juice is without fiber. It doesn't have the pulp. It, a lot of the, the, you know, when you peel an orange, you've got the white little th threads. Those have amazing compounds, which like absolutely help your lungs called bioflavonoids and they are like rocket fuel way more than vitamin C. So when you're peeling that orange, you're getting that white membrane on there, you're chewing it, so you're getting fiber. And because you have to chew it slowly, it takes longer for that um, juice to get inside your cells. And you get all the benefit of the vitamin C and the vitamin A. If somebody, like I worked on the cancer field a long time, if you have a gut cancer, like you can't eat, everything's stuck, juice will save your life. That's therapeutic nutrition. Don't juice because you think it's healthy. Eat food. If you can chew, eat food. Food fixes things. One minute. Oh, yay. So make a plan. Write down a list, four things, proteins, fruits, vegetables, whole grains. What do I like? Write it down. And then on another piece of paper, go, I'm going to buy blam, blam, blam. There's my shopping list. I'm going to buy Raisin Bran, I'm going to buy organic milk, and I'm going to buy organic yogurt, and I'm going to buy grapes, and I'm going to buy this, and have it in the house. I do what I call a big cook on the weekend, so I got the crock pot going, or I make my big giant salad, and I just pull it out and put it in my Tupperware, and I'm off to work. I work every day like everybody else, and 
you know, it's, it's like, a, pardon the pun, putting on your oxygen, though. It's like if you make the food a priority, you'll do it. You can't wait till you're hungry to, to, to do it. On some of my clients, instead of eating three meals, I say this, just do many meals. Like Carol was saying, sometimes, you know, the, the trouble that you, you have more energy that you're using to breathe. Sometimes you can't uh, eat a big, as big a meal as you would like. So I say, let's make a plan. Let's be intentional. Breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, snack. Again, uh, made up of the components that are most useful. Carol already talked about moving. If you, if you keep moving, you'll um, do well. I love this dude. I have one. It's called a floor peddler. You can put it on the table or you can put it on the floor. And I am done. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time.